Technical features on RS-2000 will be found on the engine and transaxle. Developed from the 2-litre 8-valve DOHC unit fitted to Sierra and Scorpio, this new engine again has two overhead camshafts driven by a single timing chain. The cylinder head is a completely new design. Operation of the 16 valves is through hydraulic tappets. The fuel system is also new. It has lateral fuel supply serving the injectors and those injectors operate in pairs. Unusually, the EDIS-4 electronic ignition system includes two disc coils fitted directly onto two of the spark plugs. These interesting new features on the engine are matched by the MTX-75 transaxle. As the name suggests, the transaxle combines the modern MT-75 transmission technology within a proven front-wheel drive design. A special feature of this MTX-75 is that it's already prepared to accept the transfer case for the 4x4 drive due to be introduced before long. The service implications of these new features on both engine and gearbox will be dealt with later in the program. However, there are a number of other systems on the vehicle that need to be highlighted for those in service. The power steering fitted to RS2000 is the same as that found on other Escort Orion models. And as you know, engine idle speed is varied in response to changes in hydraulic pressure in the system, for example when parking. The switch that responds to these pressure changes is now linked directly to and governed by the engine management system. As to front suspension, while it's uprated to handle the vehicle's high performance, the only obviously new features are changes to the silent bushes. At the rear, what is new is the larger diameter anti-roll bar. However, service procedures to front and rear suspension are unchanged. In the braking department, the ABS system and front disc brakes will be entirely familiar. However, the new rear disc brakes are a little different in that they have integral drum brakes for the handbrake. This means that replacement of disc brake pads is as easy as changing those at the front. Adjustment of the drum brakes for the handbrake is via a plugged hole drilled in the brake backplate which gives access to a ratchet type adjuster. Brake shoes can be changed if required in similar fashion to conventional drum brakes. So apart from its engine and gearbox, a number of features to note on this new RS2000. And in part two of this program, we'll deal with what's new when dismantling and assembling the 16-valve engine. In this second part of the program, we'll take a closer look at some of the special features on this new 16-valve 2-litre engine. In particular, we'll illustrate any unfamiliar procedures you need to know about when dismantling or assembling the engine. The first of these concerns mounting the engine in an engine stand. To fit the mounting bracket, you first remove the dipstick and tube. And although the bracket is one you'll have seen before, it must be fitted with four spacers to ensure clearance from the engine block mouldings. Something else to remember is to use a sealing compound when you finally refit the dipstick tube. Apart from the point about the spacers, you mount the engine in the stand in the usual way. 
With its 16 valves, the cylinder head, not surprisingly, is a completely new design. One of the more obvious features is the siameasing of both inlet and exhaust ports. Inside the head, two oil galleries feed both the camshaft bearings and hydraulic tappets, with overflow tubes ensuring an adequate oil level is maintained for instant lubrication after restarting. The vent holes at the top of the overflow tubes let air bubbles escape. Each of the 16 valves is inclined by 20 degrees with valve springs that are designed to be resonance free at all speeds. The combustion chamber is roof shaped with the spark plugs placed centrally for the best possible ignition efficiency. The spark plugs are also set deep into the head so you'll need a magnetized socket whenever you remove them. The procedure for removing the cylinder head is not dissimilar to that on the eight valve engine. Once the plugs, cam cover and front cover have been removed, you crank the engine to a point where the piston in cylinder number one is at top dead center. And this is indicated by the mark on the fan belt pulley being at 12 o'clock and the inner cutout on both cam sprocket wheels pointing outwards, approximately level with the top edge of the cylinder head. The upper chain guide can now be removed. Before dismantling the camshafts, note that the cam bearer caps are marked either R1 to 5 for the right hand side or L1 to 5 for the left. The two camshafts are also marked inlet and exhaust. The next step is particularly important. Before removing the cam sprockets, you must mark the timing chain position relative to each sprocket. One link out of alignment when you assemble the engine will upset the timing. Removing the sprockets is simple enough. They are held in place by a single central bolt which should first be loosened. Before you remove the sprockets, take out the securing bolt to the left-hand chain guide, otherwise the guide will impede sprocket removal. In addition, you should release the large lever arm chain guide located on a spigot that sits above the hydraulic chain tensioner. The tensioner keeps the chain taut by applying pressure to this lever arm. Releasing the arm is simple enough and it frees the chain to help removal of the sprockets. In removing the cam sprockets, remember to hold the timing chain tight as you take each sprocket off. If it slips down too far, it could become disengaged from the crankshaft sprocket, and relocating it without the sump removed could be tricky. Once both sprockets are off, secure the timing chain to a convenient spot so it can't slip back down into the engine. The lever arm chain guide is merely lifted away and then the hydraulic chain tensioner can be picked out. And this can be done very simply with a pair of pliers, although it could slip. To remove the cylinder head, the primary point to remember is that because it's aluminium, you must untighten the head bolts in the correct order. Your technician's literature publishes the tightening sequence. 
so this must be reversed. If you don't follow the correct order, there's a possibility of stress damage to the head. The only other point of note is that the piston tops on this 16-valve unit are flat-topped, unlike those on the 8-valve that have four recesses. And don't forget to leave that timing chain tied off with the engine in this state. When you come to assemble the engine, the first step is a new head gasket. The timing chain will have to be passed through the gasket. And note that it only fits one way with the two little tags positioned at the right-hand rear corner. Make sure piston number one is a top dead center before you fit the cylinder head, a step that's made easier by the locating dowels that are set into the face of the block. New head bolts are a must because the old ones may have stretched. And once again, remember to torque these bolts down to the correct torque and in the correct sequence. Information that's in your technician's literature. When you place the cams in position, apart from getting them the right way round, and the markings will help you here, make sure the slots at the front of each cam point outwards, roughly level with the top surface of the cylinder head. As mentioned, the bearer caps are marked to help you assemble them correctly. The next step is to fit a new hydraulic chain tensioner. You'll find that any new tensioner has its plunger fully compressed when it comes out of its box. And it's important to keep it that way while you position it, otherwise it can't be used. We'll come to how you release the plunger in a moment. Once the tensioner is safely positioned, you can assemble the lever arm chain guide with its spigot and the securing clip. Before you fit the cam sprockets, position the cams themselves so that the slots at the front are precisely lined up with the top face of the head. You can now untie the timing chain and fit the sprockets beginning with what is technically the left-hand sprocket, although looking at our picture you could be deceived into thinking it's the right hand. The tricky bit is getting the teeth of the sprocket in precisely the right links of the chain. and This is where your marking of the correct position will help. The large retaining washer has a convenient slot to help position it. And the central bolt merely needs to be screwed in finger tight at this stage. The procedure for fitting the right hand sprocket follows almost exactly the same path, except in one respect. You may need to ease the camshaft slightly to locate the sprocket once it's correctly engaged with the timing chain. Here again, your marking will ensure that engagement is correct. And the other check on correct positioning is that the single cutout towards the center of each sprocket should be pointing outwards. It's at this point that you should fit the locating bolt for the left-hand chain guide. The chain guide bolt and the cam sprocket fastening bolts can now be tightened 
to the prescribed talk. Releasing the hydraulic chain tensioner is done with a screwdriver positioned on top of the plunger. A smart wrap with the hand makes the plunger jump up and tension the chain via the lever arm chain guide. With the top chain guide back in place, you can now check the adjustment of the valve timing. You should crank the engine, perhaps a couple of full turns, and position it with piston number one at top dead centre, again using the marking on the fan belt pulley. Once it's at 12 o'clock, the inner cutout on each cam sprocket should be pointing outwards, approximately level with the top face of the head. Although this new 16-valve unit is in many ways similar to the 8-valve engine on which it's based, its transverse location in the Escort RS2000 has resulted in a number of detail changes. One concerns the crankshaft pulley. This is in two parts, so it can be removed from the engine while still in the car to replace the front engine oil seal, for example. The damper is merely pushed off by screwing in two long 6mm bolts once the six Torx bolts that secure the damper have been removed. As to the hub that will give access to the oil seal, the central securing bolt must be removed. You then use an available puller with three new special bolts that secure it to the hub. The rest of the procedure will be familiar. Among the other points of note on this new 16-valve engine, the flywheel is larger than on the 8-valve unit, so it can accommodate the larger clutch needed because of the increased torque. The familiar crank position sensor has moved to the side of the block and the toothed wheel fitted to the rear counterweight of the crank has been turned by 15 degrees as a result. The notch in the area of the missing tooth identifies the CPS ring for this 16-valve engine. The oil pump and its drive are the same as on the 8-valve, but the oil pump pickup tube has been redesigned to suit the revised shape of the oil pan. As to the cooling system, the water pump housing has been shortened to suit the transverse location of the engine in the car. The thermostat housing is now at the rear of the engine. It carries the coolant temperature sender for the engine management system, the temperature sender for the temperature gauge, and the switch that controls the electric radiator fan. Another small change is that the PVC valve has been moved further forward on the engine. Apart from these design details, note that the valve stem seals can be changed with the familiar special tool. There's a new air pressure adapter and a new adapter to press the valve spring retainer down. Otherwise the tool is used in exactly the same way as on other engines. Apart from the points covered in this section, all other differences between the 8-valve and this new 16-valve unit have little or no impact on service procedures. They are nonetheless fully explained in your technician's literature. Thank you.
In this third part of the program, we'll take a look at the engine management system that governs the new RS2000 and deal with any unfamiliar points of service procedure. The heart of the new model's engine management system is EEC-4. As on other Escort Orion models, the EEC-4 module is located behind the A-pillar on the passenger side. Its function is similar to other Ford models. It receives signals from various sensors monitoring engine performance, and it sends out signals to actuators that adjust and control that performance. But on RS2000, there are one or two new features. Air-fuel ratio is controlled in response to signals from two HEGO sensors, one for cylinders 1 and 4, the other for 2 and 3. Among the EEC-4 related systems you should be familiar with is the solenoid valve controlling the evaporative emission control system. There's also the pulse air system with its pulse air control solenoid. And as mentioned, one of the principal sensors, the crank position sensor, has been repositioned on this 16 valve unit, but its function remains the same. Remember that the power steering pressure switch is now linked to EEC-4. When the power steering load is increased, the EEC-4 module responds to the pressure switch by increasing engine speed. The other area where there are significant changes is the ignition system based around the familiar E-DIS-4, and we'll cover these features a little later. The fuel system on this 16-valve unit has been completely redesigned. There's a new fuel rail and new injectors fed by a lateral fuel supply. Injection is in pairs, two injectors always operating simultaneously. The arrangement of principal components sees the inlet manifolding attached to the new intermediate flange that holds injectors and the fuel supply line. This has an insulation plate shielding it from engine heat. In service, removal of injectors is simple enough. Two Torx bolts and a hold-down bracket keep the injectors in place. If you need to remove them, you'll find each injector is a pretty tight fit. And if you have to remove and then replace injectors, remember to renew their O-rings. With an injector removed, it's possible to see how the lateral fuel supply works. Fuel trapped in the bowl in which the injector sits helps to cool the component and so helps starting when the engine is warm. Fuel vapour that accumulates is fed back to the fuel tank on starting the engine. The fuel pressure regulator is a serviceable item and can be replaced if needed. And returning to the ignition system, as mentioned, it's controlled by EDIS-4 that is in turn linked to the overall EEC-4 management system. As you know, this generates sparking of two spark plugs simultaneously. The new features are to the design and layout of plug caps and the two high-tension coils. This new layout is all contained under a central cover that has a built-in suppressor. The new coils are fitted directly on top of two of the spark plugs, the one for cylinder number two and for cylinder number four. The advantage of the design is both a reduction in the amount of high tension wiring and an improvement in the security of connections in the ignition system. The overall layout is neat and accessible, making removal and replacement very straightforward.
One useful point is that the spark plug apertures are individually shaped to match the plug caps, so helping avoid any mistakes in assembly. To test the engine management system in service, you use the familiar star tester. As you know, codes are displayed in two-digit form, but the engine run test now includes some new codes. One of these affects the two HEGO sensors. Should a code 91 be displayed, it means that the two plugs for the sensors have been connected the wrong way round. The other new code covers power steering. The test involves turning the front wheels to full lock at least twice. And then, should a code 78 appear, it indicates a fault. As with all these checks where a fault code is shown, your next step is to consult the vehicle system's test manual, which will detail the repair procedure to be followed. In the final fourth part of this program, we'll be taking a look at the new MTX 75 transaxle. and also to cover a few significant service procedures. The first of these points concerns removal of the transaxle from the car. Its location is almost identical to that on other Escort Orion models. By the same token, removal follows the same procedure, except for the use of a new special tool. The right-hand drive shaft still has to be prized out of the transaxle as before. The left-hand drive shaft, however, can now be removed using the new drift and a hammer. In all other respects, however, there's no change to the removal procedure. Once out of the car, you'll find that the transaxle housing is a split design. Removal of the main cover reveals all of the interior of MTX 75. And what is particularly noticeable is the simplicity of design. The highly advanced manufacturing techniques developed for MT 75 have also been used for this sister unit. This simplicity of design will help you in service. For although we're not covering dismantling and assembly procedures in this program, the unit can be repaired in the workshop if necessary. A service microfiche has been published that covers all service procedures and they're also contained in a separate video program. One final point worth restating is that this new MTX 75 has been designed to accept the transfer case for the new 4x4 version of RS2000 due to be launched before long. In routine service, there are only one or two points to bear in mind on this MTX 75. There's a new adjustment procedure for the gear shift mechanism, which involves first setting the shift in neutral. You then loosen the clamp screw on the gear shift rod. The next step is to position the gear lever in a prescribed neutral position. And this is done by using a new special tool. It slots neatly round the gear lever, holding it firmly in place.
The final step is then to tighten the clamp screw, so completing a fine adjustment of the gear shift mechanism. The only other point concerns transmission oil. It's checked in the usual way, and should it need topping up, remember to use the prescribed lubricant. Despite its advanced specification, as can be seen, this new RS2000 with its 16-valve engine and MTX75 transaxle has been designed with serviceability in mind, so enabling you to provide customers with the usual high standard of workmanship they've come to expect from Ford dealers.